conditions. And for whatever reason, I don't know why God didn't plan on coming out talking. <laughs> Maybe I do know. <laughs> but there's this time that they're communicating from the start, right? In fact, when, that's one of the things that you do with a, with a baby that's just been born. You want them to make some noise. In fact, if that baby's not making any noise, doctors and nurses get concerned that there's something seriously wrong with the child. And they'll work to try to bring some life and response out of that child. And then we take them home, and then they make noise at 2 a.m. And 3 a.m. And maybe at 4 a.m. Because, you see, they've found that that's the time to be awake because it's quiet, right? And they learn to sleep as you went, oh, children are supposed to go on to children's worship. Oh, well. Got distracted by the microphone. They could have stayed. Have fun, Dave. David has a great lesson? Good. Have fun, Ashley. Now, does anyone else feel like a child and not want to hear where I'm going today? <laughs> By the way, if you're going to whine and cry, please, <laughs> with them. <laughs> okay, so a baby, they, 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 they start making noise. Uh, they have to be taken care of. They've got to be fed. Diapers have to be changed. They, and then you've got to start teaching them, right? And, and there's a whole journey of that. And isn't that why you had a child, if you had a child? Because you were looking forward to this opportunity. I can remember, I wondered, what are they going to look like? I still remember when Tim was born and Debbie looked at him and he had, they had used forceps to pull him out, okay? Uh, it was a really kind of long, drawn out kind of process of birth for, for Tim. And then, it, and then they had to rush him into intensive care because of heart issues and stuff like that. And so, and so when they finally got to look at him, we didn't get to hold him. We just look at him through, there's a glass here, then there's a hallway, then there's another glass and then the intensive care, and that's where he was. And we looked in there, and I still remember Debbie looking in there and like, He's ugly. <laughs> like, how am I going to take him to church? <laughs> now you have to understand, she's just given birth. It went several hours. She's in pain and all. And, and she hasn't even gotten to touch this little thing. And, and she's trying to see him from the distance and all. And frankly, if, let's, if we're really honest about it, guys, you support me on this one. How many babies really look cute? Come on, gentlemen. Girls, you, you just say that. We, we know you're dishonest, okay? <laughs> but a baby changes everything because now that family has a responsibility to raise that child. We've all seen how some of us do a good job of raising the children and some of us get in the way. Some of us hope somebody else will raise them. Some of us really never wanted to be parents and yet here's this responsibility. It's on our shoulders and all. And, and the challenge is, how are we going to help that child? And if you're a Christian, how are we going to help that child one day to come to know Jesus Christ? Isn't that the goal? Or is the goal just to have another baby? <laughs> because they're sweet and cute and cuddly and you like to have... <laughs> but what about in those tough times? You see, we become parents, hopefully, because we want to train up a child in the way that they should go. It's a responsibility and a privilege. Uh, Debbie and I um, have had a lot of people talk to us about grandparents, being grandparents and stuff like that. And uh, we are at a moment right now, um, most of you don't know, um, but our youngest son, Philip, has um, been praying and they've been struggling with trying to have children. And I just got to tell you, do you know that people are mean? The, the comments that people make to a young couple who hasn't had children and they don't and they're unable to and they're struggling with that and hurting because of it and then people make comments to them about the fact that well you must care more about your profession than you do about having a baby <laughs> we, just, we just we say mean things and we think we're somehow being I don't know interested 
so in the last um, three years they've been trying and praying and finally have felt led to do the, the um, in vitro, what's it called, fertilization process. And at the moment, there are two embryos that are coming to life inside of Jen. And that's been going on for about the last month. And um, they, sh they shared with their family on Christmas Day that after three years of praying, that they had life forming within. Unfortunately, yesterday, and we don't know what this will mean, but uh, and because it, it can mean nothing or it could mean something. Yesterday, f we're in a adult crowd, right? <laughs> yesterday, she began spotting, and um, they've already been told this is very this is very risky. There's it, the the pregnancies might not last, and so I'm just asking you to pray for them. A baby changes everything as we are working with them and praying with them and trying to love them through this. And our hope is, is that God gives them the desires of their heart. Um, we also understand that God could take those two little babies that are forming within our home before we even meet them. We understand that there could be heartache down the road. A baby changes everything, doesn't it? And we're looking at that because here's, our, here's what we look forward to is this is another opportunity for us to teach our children. Parenting doesn't end when they get married, does it? No. <laughs> or when they're 33 and unmarried. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's that relationship. You want them to continue to grow and you continue to be a part of a life. You continue to care about them. And I, and I realized as I, was, as I was preparing for this morning, this is another opportunity for Debbie and I to model our faith to our family, to our boys, and especially and specifically to Jen and Phil. Uh, we fortunately uh, haven't put the expectation on them. We haven't asked them, when are you going to have a baby? How come you haven't given us grandchildren? Or anything? And those kinds of comments like you, you, we could have said. We've simply tried to honor God and be there as a servant to them. And whatever happens to these babies, a baby surely is changing everything right now. For Phil, for Jen, and even for the rest of the family as they shared on, on Christmas Day, we want you, and they shared this with their family, said, and by, we have to remember, there's a whole ton of cousins, okay? Six children on Debbie's side of the family, there's a host of cousins, okay? Uh, and, and, and they're having babies and all that kind of stuff. But Jen and Phil said, we want to share this with you, with our family, because we don't know what will happen, but we want your prayer support. We don't want to keep it private as we're going through this. Jen and Phil are teaching their cousins and modeling their relationship with Jesus Christ in front of them for all to see. And that's what Paul was called to do. And we're going to look at 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 8, as we end the year. And, and we finish, conclude this series on A Baby Changes Everything. We, we want to look at, how are you doing as you prepare to end the year? And, and, and it's invaluable for us to examine ourselves, isn't it? Paul is literally at the last moments of his journey in life. Now, he has had some extraordinary experiences. Remember, he's the guy that got to see the risen Christ on the road to Damascus kind of changed his journey for life. And incidentally, as you, as you think about what we read here in this text, realize that Paul, though he was a zealot, though he was probably a Pharisee, though he was very religious, God had to invade his life and change the course of his life. And Paul, because of the direction and the, the passion that he had for religion did some pretty nasty things. 
He had Christians killed. He stood there and watched, holding the coats of the men who stoned Stephen, the first martyr after Jesus Christ was killed. And he celebrates and he goes passionately and he's on his way to Damascus with one thought in mind, I'm going to find some more Christians and get rid of them. Some more Christ followers because I've got to purify our nation and get rid of this evil that's in it. And, and for the rest of Paul's life, having met Jesus Christ on that road to Damascus, for the rest of his life, he will have some remorse. He will have some regret for the journey that he had been on until he met Jesus on that Damascus road. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 1 through 8. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. With great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, he's speaking to Tim, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of the evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. And now he speaks about himself. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Mm -hmm. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. What Paul understands is that he's about to pass on this work that he's been doing now for some 30 years. 30 years previously, he met Jesus on that Damascus road. He saw him, though he was blinded. He saw him, and he heard him, and he realized that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. For 30 years now, he has served Jesus Christ, preached, and been on one mission, and that is to take Christ to the world that didn't know him. God told him, he said, you know, you're going to suffer for me. And Paul suffered. Shipwrecked, stonings more than once, killed actually, imprisoned, tortured, beaten. This man went through bad stuff for one purpose, because he knew that he wanted to take Jesus Christ to his world, and he was going to let nothing get in the way of that. Christ is testing Paul, and is about to look at what Paul has done throughout his life. Paul knows that, he, because God is looking at what he's done as Paul is looking at, his, what, at what he has done to see if what Paul has done has been for Paul, God or for himself. William Barclay, in speaking of this text, said it would save us from the touchy spirit which is offended by criticism. If we understood that all that what we're doing is for Jesus Christ, then we would no longer get offended if somebody criticized us. Because what we're doing is we're trying to serve Jesus Christ. He goes on to say... It would save us from the self-important spirit which is concerned with personal rights and personal prestige. You're not that important. Jesus Christ is what matters. Barclay continues, It would save us from the self-centered spirit which demands thanks and praise for its every act. Scripture warns if, if you want praise and you want praise of men, you can have praise of men, but then you will lose the opportunity for having the praise of God in heaven. Scripture says, store up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy them. The treasures that really matter, 
What matters with your life is what you do for Jesus Christ with your life. And that's what Paul's looking at as he's examining himself. And then Barclay concludes, it would even save us from being hurt by men's ingratitude. If what we are doing is for Jesus, we're actually not going to be wanting somebody to come up to us and say, thank you, Pastor Bill. What a wonderful gift you gave me. We're going to actually kind of want to avoid that, aren't we? Because what we are doing is for Jesus Christ, not for that gratitude. It was a gentleman named Alcibiades, and I'm probably saying that wrong, so somebody who's Greek can extend to fix me later. He was the brilliant but, but, but spoiled darling of Athens. And he used to say to Socrates, Socrates, I hate you. Because every time I meet you, you make me see what I am. Barclay also in commenting on that said, the first essential is to compel a man to see himself as he is. Paul is looking at himself. Seeing himself as he is. And as we finish this year, we need to look at ourselves, not the person across the table. And we're running a race and we're going to look at that race and we're fighting a fight and it's all about how are we doing that with Jesus, not how are we doing it compared to someone else in the room. Stephen Cole says, this also means that to finish well, you view yourself as expendable in God's service. That's interesting. Paul is saying, okay, I fought the good fight, I finished the course, henceforth the crown of righteousness is laid up for me, which is Jesus Christ the Lord. I'm ready to be done. Paul is about to be, he be beheaded. And he knows it. Literally, he's going to have his head cut off. He knows it. He's in a, a terrible jail. He's no longer uh, in, in house arrest. He's in this terrible, terrible jail right there in the heart of Rome. He's probably down in a pit. It, Debbie, unless you saw the one like this in Caiaphas' house, you might remember. He's down in a pit. There's a hole in the ground, dug out, and you drop a person down in there. And the only way they get, there, there's no restroom down there. There's no running water or anything like that. Stuff has to be lowered to them. And you have to put down a rope to help them get out. And in that dirty place, where he lives night and day, as he prepares to be killed, he is examining his life. Cole says, he could finish well because he saw himself as expendable, a drink offering. In language similar to our text, Paul told the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, verse 24, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Cole goes on, he says, if you have inflated notions of your own importance... If you have inflated notions of your own importance, you will not finish well. All of us should view ourselves and all of our service as a sacrificial offering to God. Do you? Are you living your life for Jesus Christ? Or are you living it for yourself? Can you say this? I am currently involved in the struggle for the cause of Jesus Christ. There are three things that Jesus, that Paul is going to look at as he looks at his life. He's going to look at his present, he's going to look at his past, and he's going to look at his future. Verse 6, he looks at the present. Verse 7, he looks at the past, and verse 8, he looks at the, at the future. Paul is prepared for his present circumstances. Jesus told him that he would suffer much for him. Paul knows that. And Paul rejoices in the fact that he right now is going to be suffering for Jesus Christ. Paul is finishing up a battle and he knows that it's a battle. He's about to be beheaded and he's writing this letter to Timothy because he's handing the baton on to Timothy. <laughs> Young Timothy. <laughs> Timothy who needs to be courageous and he's sometimes too timid. 
Timothy who's now going to become the leader of the church and take on responsibility for the churches. And, and is he ready? Paul is hoping he is. That there's no time left. So here he gives these charges to Timothy. Incidentally, 2 Peter 1.14, Peter says something similar. He says, I know that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent. Peter and Paul both reach the end of their life. They know it's time to hand off a baton to other people. And that's what Paul is doing. Paul says, how do we know that? He says, the time of my departure is at hand. Your departure. Sounds like he's going to ride a spaceship somewhere, right? No, the, the, the time of my departure is at hand. It's interesting because it's a word that's used when you unyoke an animal that's wor been working all day. You know what a yoke is, by the way? It's, it's that c control that you put on an animal, a harness or something like that. And, and at the end of the day, when the animal's been finished doing the work, you unleash them. Uh, it, it, you have a dog, right? And you've gone out walking for them and bring them back home and you maybe you put them in the backyard and you unleash them and you let them run freely. That's that word for the time of the, the departure. It's a, it's a word used for loosening up chains of the bonds of a prisoner. A prisoner that, that gets set free from jail. That's the person that's on their departure. Or you've had them hooked up in handcuffs and some other kind of chains like that. And you take them off and you've released them. Uh, the, the word for departure is the same word as, and this one would really speak to Paul, when you loosen up a tent to pull it down because you're going to move on to another place. Paul was a tent maker, wasn't he? And so he says, look, I'm ready. I'm ready for my departure. I'm ready to, to take the tent stakes out, fold up the tent, and head on to that new place. And where is he going? I'm going to heaven. It's also the word for the slipping the ropes uh, off of a ship that's been tied and anchored at, at, at port. And you, you release that ship now to head on to its next location. And you, you untie the ropes and all. All this is what it means for Paul, when Paul says, the time of my departure, it's now. I'm, I'm getting ready to leave here. And as he, Paul does that now, he looks back at his past. Uh, we would kind of do that, don't you? <laughs> You get to the end of the year, do you look back at the past year? Or do you kind of say, oh, whew, glad there's a new one coming because this one was bad. <laughs> no, Paul, Paul's going to look back. And as he examines his past, Paul says he knows that he was in a spiritual battle. He, he says, I fought the good fight. As he looks back, he says, I fought the good fight. It's, it's a word for uh, a wrestling match. It's, it's the word from the Olympics. Uh, it says, um, in fact, William Hendrickson, writing about Paul, said, it, it had been a fight against Satan, against the principalities and powers, the world rulers of darkness in the, uh, in the heavenlies, against Jewish and pagan vice and violence, against Judaism among the Gen Galatians, against fanaticism among the Thessalonians, against contention, fornication, and litigation among the Corinthians, against incipient Gnosticism among the Ephesians and Colossians, against fightings without fears within, and last but not least, against the law of sin and death operating in his own heart. And to the Colossian church, he said, to this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Paul says, I'm in a battle. And as I look back over my life, I fought that fight. And I fought the battle every single day. As I had to fight with evil and fight the darkness. And frankly, friends, there's times that we sense that right here on this mountain in this little community. The spiritual forces that want to keep us from honoring Christ in this community are intense. And why would it matter? It's a little crest line. Because here in this community are people that are not on their way to heaven. And if God can keep Crestline First Baptist Church and any of the other churches up here struggling and stressed and upset with one another, <coughs> gossiping and fighting and treating each other without love, then in doing that, the world and the God of this world will keep Jesus Christ from being lifted up and exalted. And darkness wants to have this world stay in the dark. And Jesus wants us to shine the light. And Paul says, I've fought the good fight. And the words here for fought and fight, they, they come from the same word which gives us the word in English, agony. 
Paul says, I've agonized for the kingdom of God. In Paul's day, they were used also to refer to ancient Greek games where contestants struggled one against the other for supremacy. You think about a wrestling match. Well, these were the gladiators who were out there who were literally wrestling to save their own lives. Paul's desire is to remind us that as believers, we're not on a playground. We're on a battleground, ladies and gentlemen. And in our Christian walk, we're engaged in battle, and the best word to describe that battle at times is the word agony. He says, I've fought the good fight. Now, I can't help but turning the question to each of us, are you? Have you fought the good fight? Are you agonizing for Jesus Christ? Paul goes on, he talks about his present. He says, some more of his past, he says, I've kept the faith. Not only did I fight the good fight, but I've kept the faith. Paul has kept from wandering away from this single-minded purpose of believing and living for Jesus Christ. Back to the beginning of our text, he says, In the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge. And this is a charge that Paul lived under, isn't it? And what is the charge? He says to Timothy, Do what I've done. Listen here, Timothy. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. No matter what, where you're at, no matter what you're doing, be ready to tell people about Jesus Christ and his love for them. Watch for the opportunities as I've preached the word in season and out. But notice he also says, he says, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful understanding. We have a responsibility, friends, to one another. We have a responsibility to help each other grow closer to Christ, to become more like Him. And sometimes that means we need to correct one another. Sometimes we need to love someone enough to say, I see what you're doing and it's harmful to you. And point them a different direction. Sometimes that might actually take a tough word. And the word there is rebuke. It's wrong what you're doing. You are making a mistake. But notice how he says to do that. You correct and rebuke how? With great patience and careful instruction. <laughs> if you've raised a child, you know that if you're not patient, you're probably not going to train them well. You're probably going to get upset at them. You're probably going to throw something across the room like happened in my house a lot of times my, when I was growing up, not with Debbie. It's clarifying. <laughs> but to correct, to rebuke, and even to encourage takes great patience and love for that person. It says, incidentally, Paul goes on and says, I, I, I've... Not only have I fought the good fight, but he says, I, I've finished the course. Gotten to the end. Have any of you ever done a marathon? How long? <laughs> Not very far, but you Okay, a marathon. Do you, let, me, let me just briefly share with you where the word marathon comes from. <clears throat> The Battle of the Marathon was one of the decisive battles in the history of the world. In it, the Greeks met the Persians, and if the Persians had conquered, the glory that was Greece would never have flowered upon the world we now know. Our, our world would be different. We'd be, have a different way of thinking, even here in the Western world, because we're, we're Greek thinkers. After the Battle of Marathon, a, a Greek soldier ran all the way, day and night, from the battle to Athens with the news. Straight to the magistrates of Athens he ran. Rejoice, he gasped. We have conquered. And even as he delivered his message, he fell dead. And the marathon, the distance of a marathon, 26 and some portion there beyond that, is the distance that this man ran from the battlefield to Athens to say, we have conquered. 
And the marathon is run in honor of that man who ran that 26 plus miles. And at the end of it, he finished with nothing left. Coaches will tell you that when you're going to race a race, a, a running race, you should finish that race with nothing left. Because if you've still got something left after you've crossed the finish line, you didn't run your best race. I can remember the day that, that Tim and I were riding in the Tour de Tucson. It was a 111 mile bike ride. Our goal was to finish it in six hours. If you finished in six hours, you got a gold medal. And we're riding on that. I remember legs starting to cramp. And, and we, in fact, as we're riding along, Tim's right behind me drafting. Um, we have another word for that, but. <laughs> <laughs> we get to the finish line. I was going to bring the picture here again to show you. Some of you have seen it. We get to the finish line, and we made it there in five hours and 51 minutes. We got our gold medal. Tim was 12 years old. He was the first place finisher in kids under 15 first place finisher. By the way, there were six to 8,000 bicycle riders in that ride that day. Most of them were riding 111 miles. Some of them were riding 75, some 50, and some 25. We rode by kids that were riding these old, you know, thumpers that were, I didn't know how they were going to make it, but they were riding on that bike, and they were doing the 25-mile ride. But here's Tim right behind me, and we're heading in there. And we get in there, and Tim gets interviewed on television. And when he finishes the interview, um, this big guy, like 6'6", six, six, something like that, walks up to him and says, you're only 12 years old? I was sucking your wheel the whole last 10 miles. You got me to the finish line. Well, not only was he right behind Tim, but there was a host of about 10 or 15 other riders that were coming in there, all drafting on Tim and I. <laughs> but we got to that finish line. And you know when you're spent at the end of a ride like that and your legs are sore and all, I got to tell you, it's emotional. You cross that line and, and you, you, literally there's this emotion that comes out of you as you, you've made it. And better still, you made it according to your goal. And you've got the gold medal. Here's what Jesus wants for us and here's what Paul says is, I finished the course. I never got off track. I stood on it the whole journey. And I've finished that race. And I've gotten to the finish line. And then what does he say next? He says, I've kept the faith. Which I st went, I skipped number two, jumped to number three. Just don't forget this one. That to keep the faith means you don't get off track of what this is all about. That this is for Jesus Christ. That's who we're living for. In fact, some of you remember the name. Uh, you young kids, you don't not know this name. There's a guy named Ted Williams. He was quite the baseball player. <laughs> and, an ex and an incredible hitter. I mean, he had the, uh, and he may still, I don't remember now, but he had the highest batting average you know, of, uh, of a of professional baseball player. Just an incredible guy. Ted Williams was so focused, and, and some of these guys, they'll tell you about that they can, they can see the ball and they can see it spin. I like barely noticed where the ball was once it crossed the plate, okay? <laughs> and they, can, they can see which way it's turning. They know what it's going to do. And the ball actually will like slow down in their eyes, and, and, they, and they can recognize where it's, gonna, where it's at, and, and that's, they're able to hit it. Well, it takes an incredible amount of concentration, keen eyesight, to be able to see that ball and hit the way Ted Williams could hit. Do you know that his, his partners, his teammates, would try to interrupt his concentration? They, some of his friends actually tell a story about them throwing firecrackers at his feet as he's taking batting practice. And his concentration was so tight, so focused, that he never even noticed the firecrackers going off at his feet. Okay, folks, that is staying the course. That is keeping focused on what you've been called to do. That is keeping the faith. Whoops. It says, I've fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished the course. And there is a crown of righteousness waiting for me. And, and, and I think Paul could practically see Jesus at the end of the on the other side of the finish line. 
He's about to literally be killed for Jesus. And he can see Jesus on the other side of the finish line. Now there is in store for me, verse 8, the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who belonged and longed for his appearing. Hebrews 12 says it this way. Therefore, since we have a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And then he says, here's, here's the way to do it. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him. How did Jesus do it? How did Jesus come to earth and live those years and go to the cross? Because he kept his eyes on why he was here. The joy set before him. Why was Jesus ready, waiting for when he crossed that finish line? The victory that says, I've paid the price and they're coming home, Father. I've won the victory. And we have defeated darkness and death and the enemy. And we're, I'm coming home and they're coming to God. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And Paul says, I've kept my eyes on Jesus. And as I've kept my eyes on Jesus, that's what's enabled me to fight the good fight. To keep the faith and to finish this course set out for me is by keeping my eyes on Jesus and saying, Tim, if you're going to take over now, you've got the responsibility. I'm handing this baton on to you. And to do that, you need to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Romans 8.18 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be real, revealed to us. Paul says, there's something better coming. And so I'm not going to get distracted by all this stuff and all this suffering, all this pain, all the things I'm going through because I'm looking forward to glory and the glory of Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians, he says it this way, For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond comparison. I am not going to allow myself to be focused on the pain and the difficulties I'm going through because I know something better is coming and I'm going to keep my eyes there. James says it this way, we're chapter 1, 12. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive what? The crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. James says, I'm suffering and we're going through hard times, but I'm gonna I'm, I'm keeping my eye up there on that crown. And the crown is Jesus Himself. And Revelation concludes this way: Behold, I'm coming quickly. Jesus says, I'm coming back quickly. And when he comes, what's he going to bring with him? Well, look what verse, verse 12 says. Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Some of you think Jesus might be coming very fast, and he probably is. If Jesus were to come home, to come back here tomorrow, and Armageddon started, and all that stuff that Revelation describes, if Jesus were to come back here and say, It's time, come with me, are you re prepared? To have him assess what you are doing today. I've fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. And now a crown of righteousness is laid up for me which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Are you looking forward to Jesus and to seeing Jesus face to face? Then I have to ask you, have you passed on the baton? Are you modeling Jesus Christ for somebody else so that they can come to know Jesus? Who are you discipling? Who are you helping to grow to become like Jesus Christ? Because that's why we're here. To teach and train somebody else to become like Jesus and to hand that baton on to them like Paul did with Timothy. Here you go, Tim. Preach the word in season and out. Take it. Correct, reprove, encourage, teach others. 
Be committed to that word. Don't fall away. Watch out. There's people who want you to just speak nice things to them. They want you to tickle their ears. They don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to be challenged. They don't want to be exhorted. But speak the truth to them anyways. He says, but there's going to be those who are going to reject what you say. But he says, right. And so seriously, folks, who are you discipling? Who are you helping to become like Jesus Christ? Because that is the great crown of righteousness that God wants to give us at the end. When Revelation describes the jewels in the crown, you know what they are? I mean, come on. Do you really think diamonds are going to matter? It's like the guy who said he wanted to take all this gold to heaven. And he gets to heaven and he's brought all this gold with him. And Peter's looking at like, I'm not sure why you brought all this. We got a whole ton of pavement up here. Because the streets of heaven are what paved with? With gold. What is it that we're really treasuring? What is it that, that you can take to heaven, that, you, that, that the one thing you can take with you to heaven? You can't take money. can't take clothes. You can't take a car, even though there was a lady that had her special Mercedes and she got buried in it because she wanted to take it with her. <laughs> okay? You, you can't take anything from here except for one thing. The only thing you can take with you is another soul. You think about that. The only treasure you can store up in heaven are the people that you minister to and you witness to and you preach to and you disciple and you help them to see Jesus. And they're the ones who when you get to heaven and will come up to you and say thank you. I'm a life that was changed because of you. Folks, that is a privilege that you better not leave to pastors. That is a joy that God wants every one of you to experience. That's a jewel that God wants you to wear. But you know what it takes from you? You got to fight the good fight. You got to realize you're in a spiritual battle and people are going to want to reject God. You got to realize it's going to take some work to share Jesus Christ with other people. You got to realize you got to defeat sin in your own life and you, you've got to change things about you and you may have to clean up some things about who you are so that you can fight that good fight. That means that, that God wants you to keep the faith. He wants you to live for Him regardless of what's going on. And He wants you to... Stay on that course. Watch out because there's going to be a lot of distractions along the journey. But don't give up because Jesus Christ is looking forward to meeting you, meeting you face to face at the finish line. But you may want to do something this week. I, I spent some time reading all kinds of people's epithets, last sayings, statements that they said at the end. Uh, there, there was the one that, the guy that was um, climbing down El Capitan, he was rappelling, and he got to the end of his rope before he got to the bottom of the mountain. Last thing he said was, oh, blank. <laughs> <laughs> What's well, the uh, last words you're going to say? These are Paul's last words. I fought the good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, the crown of righteousness is later laid up for me, which is Christ the Lord. Did any of you um, come from an area where you had Borden dairy products? Borden dairy products? Then you might know, remember the name of a gentleman named William Borden. He was the eldest son of the Borden family. Bordens had millions of dollars. This is back at the turn of the century, 1900th century. Lived it and graduated from Chicago, Illinois, a high school in Chicago, Illinois. He was a member of the Moody Church. His pastor was R.A. Torrey. And, and he was set to be the top heir of the Borden dynasty, if you will, the whole Borden dairy. In 1904, he was worth millions of dollars. His parents gave him a graduation gift, and the gift was a trip around the world by ship. And he went to all kinds of places. He went to Egypt, even. He went to Hong Kong. He toured the Middle East, went across Europe, visiting capitals of Europe. I mean, he had just had a great experience. He was writing back home, and as he's writing back home, his letters start changing as he's going through it. At one point, he says to Mom, Mom, because his heart's kind of being tugged by all the people that he's meeting. He says, Mom, I, I, I kind of think God might be 
asking me to be a missionary. Pretty soon the letter came and said, Mom, God's called me to be a missionary. I need to serve this world and help them to come to know Jesus Christ. He comes back from his trip. And he goes to four years of college in order to become a missionary. Then he completes three years of seminary in order to become a missionary. He's about, to, and he's praying, you know, God, where do you want me? And he believes he's called to, to China. And specifically to a group of Muslims in China. And he's all set to leave. And his dad literally starts to die. The family comes to him and says, what will it take? What will it take? In fact... He had, as he had finished seminary and, and his dad's dying, he says he had written in the back of his Bible because he had given away all the money he had. And he wrote in the back of his Bible, no reserves. Because he had nothing left. He was going to have to trust Jesus no matter what. The family comes to him and he says, you know, hey, dad's dying. You're the one that's the best one to lead the company. How much will it take? How many cars can we give you? What can we do for you? We've got to keep you here. He says, nope, I, I can't go. I can't, I can't stay. I've got to go. I've got to follow God. And when he tells them no and he gets ready to get on the ship, he writes in the back of his Bible, no retreat. No reserves. No retreat. He heads off across the ocean. He arrives in... Um, a, I will find it in a moment unless I deleted it. Uh, he, he arrives in Egypt. And in Egypt, he comes down with cerebral meningitis. And a month later... In Egypt, not China, Borden dies. And they find his Bible and they open it up. And there's another phrase at the bottom of, at the back of the Bible No regrets, no regrets, no regrets. I've fought the good fight, I've kept the faith stayed the course and the crown of righteousness is laid up for me which is Jesus Christ the Lord <laughs> are you ready to cross the finish line and I'm not asking you are you prepared to die today because I'm not no guns here or anything like that right <laughs> but, but, but are you ready to cross the finish line because if you're not ready get ready fight the good fight keep the faith Stay the course and share Jesus with the people around you and become a discipler for Jesus Christ. Father God, here we are at the end of 2015. Wow. For some of us, life has flown by so quickly. We're amazed that it's already 2015. Lord, you've done some incredible things in our lives this year. We've seen people come to faith. Wow, God, what a privilege. And some of those students from Northwestern made commitments to you, having come from atheistic families. We celebrate those, God. God, we're in a world and in a community that's rapidly pulling away from you, blending all kinds of other things with Christianity even. And we're in a time when that battle of Armageddon could take place easily at any time. The hostilities in the Middle East where that valley sits are getting worse. Lord, we don't know how long we have for a future. But what we do know is that today you've given us an opportunity to serve you and be committed to you. Help us, Lord, to throw off those things that are hindering us. Help us to get rid of sin that gets in the way. And help us, God, to live the rest of our lives, whether it's one day, one year, a couple of decades, or uh, who knows, multitudes of decades. Lord, help us to live our lives for you. In Jesus' name. Amen.